today I'm going to be talking about corals in the Galapagos Islands and some research that I did in 2019 as a Fulbright Scholar to Ecuador. Um, and for those of you who have been to the Galapagos, you probably don't necessarily think of corals as the first um, uh, type of charismatic fauna that you might see there. Instead, you might think of things like the marine iguana or the tortoises or the many hammerhead sharks um, that you may have had the opportunity to, to see. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about why coral reefs in the Galapagos Islands are important and how they can provide us sort of a window into the future of coral reefs under climate change. So for those of you that are not familiar with where the Galapagos Islands are located, um, they are off the coast of South America here. So they are, are part of Ecuador. Um, and like I said, I was a Fulbright scholar to Ecuador, but I was based out here on the Galapagos Islands, which is about a thousand kilometers offshore. Um, and the Galapagos Islands are made up of about 13 major islands. There's also some smaller rocks out there that some, sometimes get included in the count. Um, but they span the equator here. So this is the equator and you can see there's islands. Uh, most of the inhabited islands, or actually, sorry, all of the inhabited islands are south of the equator. But there are some islands um, north of the equator that, that many people visit and you may have visited them if you took a cruise to the Galapagos. Um, but I just wanna kind of orient you to some of the major islands um, where, where there's inhabitants. So we were based here on Isla San Cristobal, um, this white point here on the southern end of the island. There is a research station there called the Galapagos Science Center, and it's co-run by the Universidad San Francisco de Quito that's based in Quito on mainland. Um, and it's also uh, run by UNC Chapel Hill. So it's sort of jointly run. Um, and that was the research station that I was based at um, for, for everything that I'll talk about today. Uh, this, is, is, this island is the second most populated island. Uh, the most populated island is over here. This is Santa Cruz Island, and this is where the Charles Darwin Research Foundation is based. Um, so this is, this is the most well-traveled island, um, and you probably, uh, if, you, if you've ever been to the Galapagos, this is probably where you started um, the cruise, or maybe you did some land-based tourism from here. And then there's another island over here, Isabella Island, where there is also a smaller, um, a smaller human population as well. But beyond these three white dots here, that most of the islands are uninhabited. Um, and so the only way to get to them is by a uh, cruise ship or, or boat. And as I said, um, I, I was here as a Fulbright scholar. So this was in 2019, right before the, uh, the pandemic hit us. Um, and I was on sabbatical from CSUMB at this time. Uh, and so I moved down to the Galapagos Islands for six months um, with my family. So you can see my husband here and my two small kids. Um, Carmela is three and Milo was five at the time. Um, so they came with us. They were enrolled in a local school. Um, we had the chance to visit the Amazon rainforest. That This picture is from here. Um, and visit a lot of the different islands to see the terrestrial uh, wildlife, the, the tortoises, the marine iguanas, the blue-fitted boobies. Um, and we did uh, several trips around to visit the different islands as part of our research, but then also um, for fun on vacation with the family. We got to visit uh, many of the different islands um, and mainland Ecuador um, during the six month period. This is the U.S. ambassador um, to Ecuador who came and visited the research lab where we were based at, and I got to share my research with him um, while he was visiting, which was really exciting. This is his wife. Um, my husband uh, also was a Fulbright scholar um, to Ecuador at the same time, um, and he was studying uh, nursery habitat for uh, juvenile hammerhead sharks and black tip uh, reef sharks. So here's some other images of my research team, including um, uh, my collaborator, Margarita Brandt, who was, or she is based at the Universidad San Francisco de Quito. Um, and she was involved in all aspects of the research, 
um, and organizing. And I also want to point out um, Steve Ryan here, who's in the audience today. Um, Steve was a graduate student who assisted on this project and played a huge part, a huge role in it. Um, and him and his wife came down and stayed with us um, on San Cristobal Island uh, for a long period of time while we were there. I think it was about a month. Uh, and then this is Caroline Rodriguez, who was another CSUMB graduate student that came down to assist in the research as well. So this was a true family adventure. It seems like so long ago now with everything that's happened in the past two years, but I feel so lucky and fortunate that we got to have this experience um, before COVID hit. All right, so I kind of already pointed out some of my um, collaborators on this project, but I just want to highlight them again here. So Margarita Brandt, again, was my, um, my Ecuadorian collaborator, and she helped uh, design all the experiments that I'll be sharing with you today, um, and especially um, helped with the logistics from getting to island and to island and all the field work that was involved. Dan Barshus was also a co-collaborator on this work. He is a professor at Old Dominion University on the East Coast. Um, and he was able to join us uh, for the field work for part of the time that we were there. But he also helped us to develop the portable coral bleaching stress system that you'll learn ab about later today um, that Steve Ryan also had an integral role in building um, and is continuing to build actually future um, more uh, streamlined versions of that system for distribution around the world. Caroline, again, is the graduate student that I pointed out Previously, um, she came down and participated in a good chunk of the field work, and she will be graduating this year with her master's degree, or this semester with her master's degree from CSUMB. And then Steve Ryan, of course, who I mentioned is in the audience today, um, who joined us with his wife um, for a good portion of the time as well. So first I wanna start off talking about the importance of coral reef ecosystems. Um, so although coral reefs occupy less than 0.1% of the ocean of the ocean area, um, they provide habitat to about a third of marine fishes at some point in their life stage and about a quarter of all marine species. So we call coral reef ecosystems the rainforests of the sea because of the high amount of biodiversity that they support. Um, and they also provide us many ecosystem services. So, Clearly, people love to go to coral reefs to dive and snorkel, um, but for small island nations, uh, coral reefs provide much of the protein in the form of fish um, to these communities, and coral reefs, the structure themselves, is what provides the habitat for those fish. In addition, corals are really important for coastal protection, um, and they shelter communities from storms and hurricanes. And they also provide many natural products. Um, so things like antimicrobial and anti-cancer agents have been found in organisms living in coral reef ecosystems. And about a quarter of what we believe to be the biodiversity uh, living within coral reef ecosystems haven't even been described yet. So there's new molecular techniques that are being used now to try to describe all the many species that live in coral reef ecosystems, but we don't even know what many of them are. And so it's hard to even know what they could offer us. Um, but because coral reefs are under threat due to climate change, um, we may be at risk to losing many of these ecosystem services. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the idea or the concept of coral bleaching. Um, it's been headlined in the news, uh, especially over the past few years, there's been several back-to-back -back massive coral bleaching events that have occurred around the world. Um, so I wanted to just take a minute to describe what coral bleaching is. Um, so coral uh, that becomes bleached turns bright white, like this image here. Um, but what causes that? So a healthy coral um, is in a symbiosis with a microalgae called zooxanthellae. This is a dinoflagellate algae that lives inside the tissues of the corals. And this algae provides, um, through photosynthesis, it provides energy to the coral. And in exchange, the coral itself um, provides protection for the algae that lives inside of it and also provides the algae nutrients. So this is the main source of food for corals, um, but during times of heat stress, so when temperatures become 
um, a little bit warmer than the average maximum summertime temperature that is experienced on a reef. This can typically happen at about one or two degrees Celsius above that temperature. The coral becomes stressed and this symbiosis falls apart. And when that happens, these microalgae begin to leave the coral. There's still a lot of research being done on the mechanisms exactly that drive that, but we know that they, there's a disruption, the algae leave, and the corals become bright white like this. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the corals are dead, but it does mean that they are susceptible to mortality if temperatures remain warm long enough because they're in a state of star starvation. And they are also more susceptible to diseases. And so coral, coral bleaching is not a good thing for corals. And um, it uh, has become increased uh, in frequency in coral, it's increasing in frequency, sorry about that, um, in all the major reef regions around the world. So you can see here the major um, the regions with the Galapagos being over here in what we call the Eastern tr Tropical Pacific. Um, and you can see there's not that many corals in this region. We see much higher diversity of coral reefs over here in the Western Pacific where waters are warmer um, and there's more shallow habitat for reefs to form. In the Eastern Pacific, as you know, uh, the waters are cooler and we um, both along the coast of California and along the coast of South, South America have upwelling systems that bring up cool, nutrient-rich waters right along the coast. And so we'll learn in, in a few slides um, why this makes the Galapagos Islands a really unique place to study corals. Um, but going back to the fate of corals under future climate change, there's been several studies that have shown that with the rate of warming that we're seeing today, that corals are expected to um, bleach so frequently that by the years 2030 to 2050, uh, using the output from global climate models, we expect that corals will essentially disappear due to high frequency bleaching that they can simply no longer recover from. But some of the work that I did as a postdoc um, at Princeton um, also uh, gives a little bit more of a nuance to these predictions. So um, I'm a physiologist, as Michelle mentioned at the beginning, so I'm, I'm very interested in understanding the effects of climate change on marine organisms and to what capacity they may be able to increase their temperature thresholds or their physiological thresholds under um, the changing environment that we expect with climate change. And so this is a, a modeling exercise that I did um, in a paper that was published in Global Change Biology back in 2014, where we, we looked at the percent of uh, global reefs that would experience high frequency bleaching under future climate change. So high frequency bleaching is two mass events that occurred within a previous decade, which would be um, frequent enough that reefs would not really be able to recover from that. And so the dotted line here is um, the predictions that I just mentioned, um, whereby corals with no capacity for adaptation or acclimation um, would be expected to kind of hit this 50% threshold mark by around the year 2040, whereby 50% of reefs around the world would, would be experiencing this high frequency bleaching. And with all reefs around the world hitting this um, uh, at 100% of reefs by the year 2060. Um, however, this, this model, the dotted line, and other models that have been published prior to this study um, assumed that corals would not have any capacity for adaptation. And so in this exercise, um, we simulated the ability of corals to adjust or increase their thermal limits um, based on the recent thermal history that they would experience. So if we Instead of um, assuming that corals are adapted to temperatures that, that um, they experienced prior to warming, if instead they could adapt or adjust to temperatures that they'd experienced more recently. Um, so for example, in this case, this is a uh, corals that could adapt to the prior 60 years of sea surface temperatures. Then we see a very different picture. So you see a delay between the dotted line and this gray line for when they cross the 50% mark. And you see that there would still be corals by the year 2100. 
Now, of course, we don't know um, how quickly corals can adapt or to what extent they might be able to adapt, but we do know that they can. And many scientists are studying the different mechanisms by which corals can increase their thermal limits. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, um, uh, these mechanisms today, although this is an active area of research within my lab. Um, but I do wanna point out that you know, these types of predictions are extremely concerning um, to uh, coral reef managers um, and to policymakers. And so recently I was invited to be a part of a National Academy of Sciences committee to look at potential human interventions that could be used to increase the persistence of coral reefs under future climate change. So we, um, as a group, we reviewed 23 different types of human interventions everything from like moving corals from more heat tolerant locations to places where corals have been decimated by bleaching, um, creating GMO corals in the lab or gen genetically modified corals that have higher thermal tolerance and then putting them back up onto the reef. Um, other geoengineering approaches like seeding clouds to increase shading during times of heat stress. Um, and also uh, microbiome manipulation. So manipulating the, the bacteria and the viruses and the symbionts that live inside corals to potentially increase their thermal tolerance. Um, and we, so we published two reports from this committee. The second report was really aimed directly at coral reef managers. So if you're a manager on the ground in the Caribbean, say, and you're watching the, the coral reefs basically disappear, um, in front of your eyes where there's been huge decimation of corals, both due to climate warming, but also disease. Um, this uh, framework essentially gives them the tools that they would need to decide whether or not a particular type of inter intervention might be beneficial or risky in their, in their location. Um, and so this was, uh, this was a really more applied uh, report and I want to share with you a short video talking about the process of how we developed these reports and why they're so important. Corals are threatened like never before. Coral reefs as ecosystems are perhaps one of the world's most threatened ecosystems from the point of view of climate change. But there are in fact hundreds of millions of people around the world who all depend on coral reefs for their livelihoods. And they're also incredibly valuable in protecting our coastlines. There's a good scope for a National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine review to come together and really look at what's the problem, what can we do from the best possible science because we really need science to be the foundation. This review of, of interventions um, brought together a wide-ranging set of scientists, and we delved into the literature on what people have been talking about for the last couple of years, sometimes for the last couple of decades, about how to increase coral resilience in the face of mostly ocean warming. Our first report contains a list and a deep dive into each of 23 different interventions that people around the world have been thinking about. We're testing whether corals from the Eastern and Western Caribbean can breed with each other, and then testing whether any of their babies are extra strong, extra fit, extra good at growing fast or reproducing well, or surviving warm temperatures. The topic and the focus of our second report is to how to take this set of tools and then decide how and when and where to apply them in any particular given circumstance. The report was originally commissioned by NOAA and it's very management directed in terms of how do we take the best of modern knowledge and um, really move from the science to policy realm and also from knowledge to action. You know, my belief is that we haven't solved it yet because we haven't had a serious crack at solving it. And I'm a firm believer that we can bring some of these ideas to the table and start using them. This report really is about a bridge to the next century. What will it take to allow coral reefs to survive that period of time and still produce the kinds of services and value to human communities that they do now? Um, so yeah, that kind of gives you a little bit more background um, for what we were trying to do with these reports and kind of the state of, of the science. Like 10 years ago, it would have been um, not okay to talk about human interventions in coral reef ecosystems. 
Um, but now it's pretty much all anyone is talking about at coral reef conferences because uh, the the predictions and the frequency of bleaching is occurring so quickly now that people are really scared that we're going to lose these ecosystems entirely. So why study corals in the Galapagos? Um, so now that you kind of know the plight of corals under climate change, um, one of the, the reasons that we are um, going all over the world now is that we are hunting for tough corals. We are hunting for corals that might be thermally tolerant or tolerant to future climate change conditions. Um, and so that's what led us to the Galapagos and I'll, I'll explain why. So first of all, corals in the Galapagos are already living in fairly marginal conditions for coral reefs. So as I showed you earlier, most um, big reefs uh, with high biodiversity are in the Western Pacific. Um, and in the Eastern Pacific, because of upwelling, um, the process that brings up cold nutrient rich waters, um, they're also exposed, the reefs here are also exposed to more acidic conditions. Um, and so ocean acidification can, can really have negative effects on the ability for corals to calcify and grow. Um, and so these corals are already living in more relatively more acidic um, waters than in other places. Um, and they also experience huge swings in temperature, both on the, the warm side and the cool side. And so we're really interested in understanding what makes these corals so tough. Um, and this might provide us sort of a window into the future of what coral reefs might look like under future climate change. So um, I mentioned that corals in the Galapagos Islands experience a really wide range of temperature. And that is due in part to um, the, the many different currents that bathe the islands here. So um, during the winter months, uh, so from about like August to December, the waters around the islands can get quite cold because the Humboldt current is bringing up really cold waters from the Antarctic. Um, and cold waters are also coming via this Cromwell current. But at the same time, during other parts of the year, um, we have warm water coming from Panama and the North Equatorial countercurrent that are bathing the islands in warmer water. And so what we see is that there's a huge thermal gradient across the archipelago um, that changes from season to season. And so this is an image of the mean sea surface temperature around the Galapagos Islands. Um, so you can see in purple, these are cooler temperatures and it can get quite cold on the western, sort of southwestern side of the archipelago. Um, whereas up here in the northern part, um, these two islands up here are called Darwin and Wolf, um, and they are, they're famous diving spots um, uh, worldwide. And the waters up here are much warmer. Um, we also see a difference in the range of temperatures that are experienced, depending on whether we're in the southern part of the archipelago or the northern part. So down here in the south, we see that the amplitude of temperature can vary um, on average by three degrees Celsius, whereas in the north, where the purple and the blue is, you can see that these islands experience a much narrower range of temperatures. And um, a lot of research has been done in the Galapagos um, for some time, and we have a pretty good track record of where reefs um, were, have, have been located around the islands. And um, we also have a good track record of how sea surface temperatures have changed around the islands since the early 60s. So um, this island here again is Santa Cruz Island. It's where the Darwin Research Foundation is based, and they've been taking um, temperature uh, right in the waters outside of the research station um, for a long period of time. And so you can see this is sea surface temperature here. Um, and on the bottom, we have accumulated heat stress. So it's either cold stress, if it's red, this is um, temperatures that are higher than normal, or blue would be temperatures that are lower than normal. And I want to point out these two big red areas here and here. So the first one is um, associated with the 1982-83 El Nino event, where there was a huge temperature spike in the Galapagos. Um, and then again, in the 1997-98 El Nino event, you can see that there was another big warm anomaly, almost um, as large as what was seen in the 1982-83 El Nino event. Now, this first event that occurred in 1982 and 83 
um, basically killed off almost all the corals around the Galapagos. So there was severe bleaching. This was one of the first like recorded mass bleaching events um, that scientists uh, uh, were aware of. And it led to 97% mortality at 14 different sites around the islands. Um, and this also led to the destruction of 16 of the 17 structural reefs that were located um, around the islands. So when I say structural reefs, I mean the kinds of reefs that you think about when you think of a big, um, large, well-built uh, structural or uh, coral reef where all the corals are sort of growing on top of each other and next to each other. Um, so there was only one of these types of reefs left after this El Nino event. So here's a map of um, the different locations where there is now existing coral community. So in green, these are places where we have corals now. And then in this uh, closed circle here, this is the only location up in Darwin um, where we, we have like really well-formed structural reef. The red is uh, indicating locations where there used to be reefs or coral communities that are no longer present. Now, some good news is that during subsequent El Nino events, so for example, that 1997-98 event where we saw another really big warm anomaly, um, scientists found that there was relatively less bleaching than what was predicted um, compared with the 1982-83 El Nino event. And it was hypothesized at the time that maybe the coral populations um, are more heat tolerant at this point. So maybe some of those surviving corals from the 82-83 El Nino event were able to repopulate um, around the archipelago and lead to higher thermal tolerance overall. But we have also seen since then that there have been cold water bleaching events as well. So corals can bleach under really hot conditions, but also under really cold conditions. And so the question that we sought to ask for this um, research project was, are these recovering coral populations more heat tolerant? And is there a trade-off between heat tolerance and cold tolerance, given that they appear to be more heat tolerant, but maybe that makes them less cold tolerant? Um, or perhaps do these recovered populations have a wider thermal breadth? And what are the conservation implications of this? And so um, we, our team went out and we sampled corals from the recovering populations. So we went to most of the places with a green dot here. And we tested corals in these locations um, to look at and see what their tolerance was to both cold and heat stress. Um, and then the third component of this approach is to examine the potential mechanisms that might be underlying thermal tolerance to either cold or heat. Um, and this is sort of the, the piece of the project that we are still actively working on with samples that we collected, but now we have those samples back in the lab at CSUMB um, and graduate students are working on this right now. Um, so our collection sites again included Darwin and Wolf, these two sites, Isabella Island, Santa Cruz Island, San Cristobal, Española, Floriana, and we had tried to get to Marchena, but unfortunately it was the conditions, the sea conditions were not good enough for us to get in the water that day. It would have been dangerous. So that's the one location that we do not have samples from. Um, but today I'm just gonna share with you the results from three of the, or sort of, well, four islands, three locations across this broad thermal gradient. So um, you may recall from the sea surface temperature uh, that I showed earlier that the southwest is the coolest part of the archipelago and the warmest part is up here north of the equator where Darwin and Wolf are located. And then San Cristobal corals represent sort of an intermediate um, site along that thermal gradient. So we targeted two different species um, that are, are present uh, at all the islands. So we chose a massive coral species called Pavona clavis, um, and then a branching coral species, um, which is actually really hard to identify to the species level. So we kept that at the genus level. This is called Pasalabra. And we collected eight different colonies or like individual corals per each of the sites that we visited. And then we ran these cold and heat stress assays. So this is where um, 
uh, Steve Ryan's work came into play. So he helped us to build a unit called a CBAS, and that stands for Coral Bleaching Autonomous Stress System. Um, and you can see the, the inner workings of it up here. So it's based on an Arduino um, that can control the temperature um, and heat up or cool down the water in these different tanks. So these are lights up here. The corals need light to photosynthesize. Um, and you can see fragments of corals that we have collected. And then in each of these tanks, we can either increase or decrease the temperature um, using the controller system that we built. And this system is incredibly powerful. Um, so you can fit the entire system into four suitcases. So we built this system here at CSUMB. Um, we brought it down with us on an airplane. It's easy to transport on, on ships and vessels. Um, and it allows us to rapidly evaluate coral bleaching thresholds in the field. So you can see here the system is set up on the back of a boat. So this was on our trip um, to the northern islands of Darwin and Wolf. So it's highly portable. Um, it's fairly low cost to build. So it's about $1,500. And it requires um, fairly low energy requirements. And all these things are really important because most coral reefs around the world are located in very far away places. Um, and much of the, the research that's done on coral reefs is, is done by um, uh, scientists that live in places where they may not have access to the kind of grant money that we have here in the United States. So being able to build these systems um, fairly cheaply with parts that you can buy from the hardware store is really important for bringing this kind of system to reefs around the world. And that, in fact, is exactly what is happening right now. So although I'm just sharing you the work um, for how we've used the system in the Galapagos, it's being used in the Red Sea, in uh, American Samoa, uh, in the Great Barrier Reef um, as well. So the system itself has eight tanks and we can, we, ha we have a duplicate system. So we have two tanks per temperature and we added two coral fragments from each of the coral colonies that we collected. And we ran a heat stress experiment on one day and a cold stress experiment on the very next day. Um, and so on the heat stress day, we brought the temperature up to 35 and a half degrees, which is pretty warm. And on the cold stress day, we brought the temperatures down as low as 12 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature of the water right out here in Monterey Bay. But like I said, the temperatures in the Galapagos can get very cold, particularly in the southwestern islands. So this is what the profile looked like that we, we used in the Aquaria system on the heat stress day. So the experiment would begin, we would add all the corals to our sea bath system, um, and then the temperature would ramp up depending on which tank they were in. So there was always a control tank, and then we either increase the temperature to 31, 32 and a half, or 34 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we brought the temperature back down and we tested the health of the symbiotic relationship that the coral has with its algae. So we basically were looking at um, how well photosynthesis was working via photochemical efficiency. And then we would hold the corals overnight at control temperature. And then the next morning, we would look at them and see whether or not they had bleached. On the cold stress day, we essentially did the same thing, except instead of bringing the temperature up, we brought the temperature down. Um, and did the same measurements that we did on the heat stress day, looking for um, how well the symbiosis was holding up and then um, looking at bleaching. So more specifically, how do we measure signs of physiological stress in corals? Um, first, we, we just take a simple measurement by eye um, using something called a coral reef watch card that has different colors here along the outside. You basically hold up the card to the coral fragment, which you can kind of see in the background here, and an observer measures um, the, the color on a scale from one to five. So this is um, super quick, super cheap and easy, but it can be subjective depending on who the person is or if you're rotating who the observers are. We also did an endpoint uh, photograph. So this is another quick and fairly cheap method. Um, and it's less subjective than the color card. And we can pull out the red intensity from the photographs that we take to get a measure of um, bleaching. And then we also used this method called photochemical efficiency, which I mentioned before. It's a quick way to look at the health of the algal coral symbiosis. 
It's also much less subjective than these other two measurements. And it captures non-visual signs of, of stress in the coral algal symbiosis before you might see it visually. So these are the three measurements that we would take. Um, and again, the, the, symbi the symbiosis um, measurement, which is um, taken using something called pulse amplitude modulated fluorometry, um, allows us to look at the photochemical efficiency or um, essentially the, the efficacy of photosystem two within, uh, within photosynthesis. And so you can kind of just see here, these are measurements that one would take um, using this PAM fluorometer and higher values are indicative of a healthier coral, a darker color, you can see that here, and lower values are um, indicative of bleaching. And so, um, Again, this is just to give you, before I show you the results, um, uh, the, the FBFM values, which is the output from this fluorometer. Um, so higher numbers are going to be indicative of healthier corals with good photosynthetic efficiency. M moderate values mean bleached or stressed, and then lower values mean the coral may have, have died. And so let's take a look at the results. So first, I'm just going to show you some results from one of the sites on San Cristobal Island. This was the island that we were based at. Um, so we did a lot of uh, the initial experiments here. So we would, again, heat the corals up and then measure their photochemical efficiency as the temperature increased. So we have temperature here on the x-axis and then this photochemical efficiency on the y. So higher numbers are, are good. So um, as you might expect, as the temperatures increase, you see a decrease in the photochemical efficiency for both of our species with Pavona clavis on the left and Pasolapra on the right here. Um, and, you, and you definitely see the biggest drop at our highest temperature um, here, 35 and a half degrees Celsius. Um, but you also see inter-individual variation between corals um, uh, within each temperature group. This is the same plot now for cold stress. Um, and you can see that there's a more gradual decline in the photochemical efficiency as we um, decrease temperatures. And um, you can see here again, there's also some variability um, and that variability is usually highest at the lowest temperatures or the highest temperatures. And so we can use these curves. You can imagine you could create sort of a line through here um, to compare how uh, corals respond to temperature across the different sites that we visited. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, so I'm showing you here again the sites on this map so you can remember whether they came from a warm location in the archipelago or a cooler location. And what we can see here is the two northern islands here, the warmest locations. Isabella, which is the coolest location down here with the purple, and then Punta Pit, which is on San Cristobal Island, and this is one of our moderate temperature sites. Um, so you can already kind of see here that there's a huge or a much bigger drop off for some of the sites and some of the species than others. So on Isabella Island in particular, we saw that these corals tended not to be as heat tolerant um, as corals from the northern island locations. Um, now we're looking at the results from the cold stress experiment. So we have the same four islands that I just showed you, but now um, the control temperature is on the right and then we're decreasing temperature as we move to the left. Um, and you can see across all the islands that the um, change in the photochemical efficiency is more gradual under cold stress. Um, but you can also see that there are certain sites where um, there's more of these dots that are below this threshold here. and so. This um, uh, species, Pasolapra from Isabella, um, was one of the most uh, cold sensitive species. So it wasn't very tolerant to heat or cold, unfortunately. And so if we look at the statistics and we compare the results across the different sites for our cold stress and our heat stress experiment, what we find is that the Isabella corals were the least heat tolerant compared with all the other sites. And we also found that the Isabella corals were the least cold tolerant as compared to the northern sites. Um, so this was very unexpected because we 
thought that the corals living in the cooler locations would be more cold tolerant than those living in the warmer locations. Now, if we look now at the other species, we see similar trends. Um, we also found that the corals from Isabella were least heat tolerant compared with the other sites. And we also found that the San Cristobal corals were less cold tolerant than Darwin or one of our northern sites. Um, and that you can see here. So I'm not going to go into the details of the graphs, but I just want you to kind of see the data and, and get the take home messages from this. So if we put this all together now and we look um, at the coral thermal breadth um, across the different sites that we visited, we found that the corals in the north here in Darwin and Wolf um, had the largest thermal breadth. So they were most cold tolerant and most heat tolerant. So this was unexpected kind of compared to what we had gone into this project thinking might be the case. Um, for our sort of moderate uh, temperature location, San Cristobal, and Española, which is the island covered up here by my mouse in this picture, um, we found that the corals were sort of intermediate. They had a little bit less cold tolerance, a little bit less heat tolerance overall. And then we found that the corals from Isabella Island um, had the narrowest thermal range, and they also um, were not nearly as heat tolerant. And in some cases, they were even more cold sensitive than the northern sites. And so we became concerned about these corals that are in Isabella Island because it's one of the biggest tourist locations in the Galapagos. And the site where we collected these corals from also is known to be um, a clonal population, meaning that these corals are, have the same genetic background. Um, they, they come from asexual origins, and this was based on another study that showed that did population genetics and looked to see how related these individuals were um, and found that this aggregation of corals is basically, um, you know, one, the same clone. Um, and so it's, it's uh, even more concerning that these corals um, have the least heat tolerance and sort of moderate cold tolerance because um, they don't have that much genetic diversity in the first place, which means it's going to make these corals, uh, it's going to be harder for these corals to genetically adapt to future changes because they don't have that much genetic diversity to begin with. And so we think that um, these corals probably originated from some surviving corals or a surviving coral even from the 1982-83 El Nino event. Although it's really hard to, to know that answer for sure, because it is still possible that there could have been um, recruitment of, of coral babies that came in from somewhere else. So, so I've now shown you how we've done this first assessment of Galapagos coral thermal tolerance. So what have we learned? Um, we found that the, the coldest site, the Isabella corals, were in fact most heat sensitive compared to all the other sites. But for one of the species, they were also the most cold sensitive. We found that the corals in the northernmost islands, which are the ones that are also the most recovered from that 1982 83 El Nino event, and the only structural reef that's still present in the archipelago, has the widest thermal breadth. We also found that the thermal tolerance was generally pretty similar um, within a site. Uh, and we saw that this, the two species had similar thermal tolerances that were more associated with site rather than species. So this suggests that there's um, a climatization to the local conditions um, or the local temperature that is experienced at each site. And we also saw pretty high variability in thermal tolerance among individuals within a site and even among clones um, within the Isabella site. So we know that um, you know, an, a genotype can interact with its environment to have different um, phenotypes or different tolerances. Um, and we, we are seeing that in the Isabella population. So what are some of the broader implications and next steps? Um, so we think that the corals in the Northern Galapagos Islands are, are probably going to be more tolerant to future warming. Um, so they are more tolerant to broad swings in temperature and more heat tolerant overall. 
Um, but we think that we, we have some pretty strong evidence for the corals and Isabella needing more protection. Um, and the, as I said, this is a popular tourist destination and visitors are, can walk down this, um, this walkway here. You can see this is the location where we sampled them, um, just carrying their, their, their snorkel and their fins and they jump in at the end of this walkway. And a lot of the tourists might not know how to um, be careful uh, around corals because these corals uh, can be damaged very easily. So if you accidentally hit them with your fin, that can actually break the coral off from, from the substrate um, and the coral could, could potentially not be able to recover from that event. And so um, the, there is a need for more uh, education for tourists that are getting in the water there because it's a, it is a small population of corals, they're clonal and their heat tolerance is, is not great. Um, and although we see that there's variation in the thermal tolerance of the individuals among these clones, that's a good sign, but we still don't really know what makes some of those individuals tougher than others. And so um, I'm, I'm near the end of the talk, but I do want to say that um, we have plans to go back to the Galapagos next year and visit the same sites that we visited back in 2019. Um, and we plan to resample the sites and, and redo some of these measurements and then also take other um, uh, samples to look at what is the, um, the genetic uh, makeup of these corals. Um, and we also have these samples that we collected from 2019 that we're working on in the lab right now to understand the mechanisms that um, drive heat versus cold tolerance. So are there particular sets of genes that are expressed, for example, in individuals that are more versus less heat tolerant? And can we use these genetic profiles sort of as an indicator of whether or not a coral is more or less tolerant to heat or cold stress? So that's what we're doing right now. Um, and so I want to go ahead and thank all of the, the people and the many funding sources that went into the research that I have shared with you today. Um, so in addition to the Fulbright Fellowship that I had, um, we also had uh, funding from the National Geographic Society, um, and we had support from the Galapagos Science Center, the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, and a, another grant that I had through CSU MB, um, and the, again, the uh, Galapagos National Park um, gave us all the permits to do this work, and we also had some funding from the Coral Reef Alliance. And these are uh, many of the people that helped us in the work that I presented today, including the four um, superstars that are shown here. Um, and we also were able to include um, some students, some Ecuadorian students in the research as well. Um, that either helped us out on our cruises or that were involved in a marine ecology course where um, th that was based in the Galapagos where the students got to participate in some of the research. I also just want to connect all of you with the College of Science. Um, I really appreciate being invited to this group to share my research and um, as Diane mentioned at the very beginning of this call, um, there are many really awesome faculty um, within the College of Science that would be pleased to share their research with you as well. Um, so I hope that um, you can reach out to them for future uh, OLLI lectures. This wraps up my, my talk for today. Thank you so much.